How are you guys all doing? It's good. Yeah, good to see your faces. Some I haven't seen for a while, so I'll just soak it all in. The balcony, you're, you guys are so dark, I, could, I can't see you. But you're up there? You're up there? Yep, okay, sweet. Good stuff. Well, yeah, we're continuing the, the Summer in the Psalm series. Uh, summer is ending. It doesn't feel like it, though, right? But um, I'm really excited for September to come. And as you see, there's new courses that are coming all the time. Uh, we'll be having a partnership class as well. That's starting September 7th, too. So that sign-up is online as well. So that's open to anyone that's been here uh, or made this their home church for around six months. And that online, I think, would count too, because for a time, that was the only option, right? So, yeah, it's good. It's going to be really fun, but summer is still here, so let's continue in the Psalms. Awesome. Let's pray. Yeah, God, thank you for who you are and your presence that's here with us, God. And we just pray that you would just continue to be honored and glorified, Lord God. Um, we want to sing your praises forever like we, we sang and that's just awesome that we get to do that. And, and Father, yeah, we just pray that we continue to worship as we read your word. God, speak to your people. Thank you that um, you see everyone. I can't see everyone in the balcony and, and everyone here. I won't make eye contact. But that doesn't matter because you're the one that's teaching us. You're the one that's speaking to us. You're the one that's um, reaching our hearts. Uh, you're the one that's, yeah, um, speaking to the people watching online as well, God. So we thank you for that. Thank you that you're here in this time we can have together. Amen. Awesome. Uh, who has been to the Grand Canyon before? It's grand, correct? It's pretty grand. That's why they call it the Grand Canyon, I think. But when, when you go to the Grand Canyon, um, you arrive there and it's a little bit like, whoa. It's, it's kind of breathtaking. It's kind of like, this thing is big. It's bigger than a ditch, that's for sure. Uh, and what happens, too, is you, you want to eventually take a picture of it, right? It's like, man, this thing looks so cool. I'm going to take a picture. And it's almost kind of crazy what happens because it, what, what it felt like when I ever took a picture of the Grand Canyon, you looked at the picture and it was just like, nah, that's, that's not it. Like, that's, that's not what I'm seeing with my eyeballs and smelling with my nostrils and just, like, looking at. The Grand Canyon's more grand than what's, what's on a picture. Uh, and I kind of think um, it's almost that way with, with us and God. Uh, whether we think we're smart or not, our brains are too small to fit how grand and how awesome God is. Right? And so when, when, we, when we pack all that... Uh, how amazing and how big and how awesome God is. We pack that into my little brain. It, it, it doesn't, I can't quite grasp everything. I can't quite attain who God really, really is. But, but we, it says in 1 Corinthians, it's the verses and up there, but in 1 Corinthians 13, now I see dimly like in a mirror. So I can, we can get a sense of God, but we don't get the full picture. And, and this verse is blowing my mind um, this week, it says, then um, I will know fully as I'm fully known. That's wild. I will know God fully as he knows me fully now. I don't even know what that means. Like, that probably means I'm getting a hardware upgrade somewhere to grasp really who God is. But I honestly think that that, that moment of seeing him face to face, it says that's when this will happen. That moment is just going to... I don't even know. Like, it's mind-blowing. I can hardly preach now when I think about that because it's crazy. But now we're here on earth, and we can still see God, but dimly. And I think it's good to have our, try to grasp at the greatness of who God is. I think that's a good thing to do, even though maybe it's, it's like taking a picture of a Grand Canyon. And this is what Psalms 139, I think David's kind of doing. He's really just surveying how great, how big, how awesome, how knowledgeable God is. It says this, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty 
for me to attain. So again, David is just looking at, at the knowledge of God and he's just blown away. He's like, this knowledge is wow. I can't, I, I can't quite understand this. I can't quite grasp this. And I think us as humans, it's hard to, for us to grasp this knowledge, right? Because we are, are beings that learn. We, we grow up and we come into this world and we don't know a whole lot and, and we start learning and, and getting to know more things all the time. We're, it's a continual journey of learning. In our relationships, it's a continual journey of, of getting to know each other, right? If we're growing in relationship with one another, you're probably getting to know each other. And that's what I uh, ended up asking Valerie, I don't know, a few years ago. Hey, do you, do you want to get to know each other? And we've been getting to know each other ever since. Uh, and we're continuing to get to know each other. There's not a point where you arrive and it's like, now I, now I know who you are. You know who I am fully. I, I don't think so, right? And this is, this is kind of the wild thing about our relationship with God is we, we get to know God, but God doesn't get to know us. God just knows us, right? He knows us fully, Every, everything, everything. All the mistakes you've made, all the good things you've done, all the thoughts you think, he just knows you. And it says in Hebrews 4.13, there's no creature hidden from his sight, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give an account. It's kind of maybe a little bit of a scary thing. We're going to give an account and, and we'll just be naked before God. Everything will be exposed. Everything is going to be revealed because God knows us. God knows us. And Adam and Eve, they wanted to, to hide from God, right, when they made a mistake and be like, oh, maybe he won't find us, but that just doesn't work, right? All creatures are, are not hidden from his sight. You can't hide from God. He knows your hiding spot before you hide, right? And I think this reality, um, it's important for us to know that God just knows us. And so when we stand before him, we're, it's not gonna be like a job interview where we try to sell God on our talents or sell God on our good life. God's not going to ask us the, question, the, the job interview question, maybe the worst job interview question, what's your greatest weakness, right? What's your greatest weakness? And you have to like, word a, like you kind of just say a strength, oh, I care too much and I work too hard. <laughs> but then your boss knows you're probably like, uh, the person interviewing knows, okay, this person's fake. But what if, do you actually tell your greatest weakness? I don't know. What would happen if you would just say, I'm not very responsible and I forget things all the time. <laughs> Well, you're not hired, but you are honest, so I don't know. <laughs> but when we see God face to face, it's just going to be boom. He knows me. He knows you. And I think this is maybe scary, but it's actually, in my mind, this is actually super comforting because I don't need to hide from God. I don't need to, my relationship with him doesn't need to be like a job interview. I can just be real, and God still loves me. Think about that. God still loves me, and he still died for me, and he still made me, and he still chose me. Um, how incredible is that? I think that, that just gives me a, like, wow. It, it, it makes me see, God, your love and your mercy must be great, because I make some dumb mistakes. I look at mankind, and I'm like, God, you died? You died for this? Like, this? Like, we killed you. Wow, God, you're so good. You're so awesome, God. And I thank you that, that even though you know me, you do love me still. Wow, you're good, God. It makes me even more grateful for his love in my life. I think another important reality to consider about God truly knowing me is that I believe he's the only one that really knows me. Think about that. My wife knows me, absolutely. My parents know me, absolutely. I know me, but I don't even think I know me to the extent that God knows me. God knows me, who I was created to be, who he made me to be, the plans he has for me. 
And I know me to an extent, and the people around me know me to an extent, but I think my maker is the one and the only one that fully, truly knows who he made me to be and the plans that he gave for my life. Crazy. And so because I think that's true, it's really, really, really important that, that we get to know God. We get to know ourselves through his word. We get to know ourselves through relating with God. And, and I think this is why David at the end of the Psalm 2, he says, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Does David know his heart? To an extent, but not the full, full picture. I think sometimes I can know my heart, right? Sometimes, sometimes when I've had a week where my patience is wearing thin and all of a sudden I make a comment that's a little short with someone and I'm like, wow, Brenton, okay, something's going on here. Let's work on this. That wasn't a loving thing to do. But God just knows my heart, my thoughts, my intentions, my motives to a deeper level. And so this is why it's important that God searches me and tests me, and sees if there's any offensive way in me, and then leads me in the way everlasting. Because I I don't, he leads me, right? Because he just knows more, and I want to learn and submit to the ways, his ways, and not my, what I think are his ways. I want his ways, right? I remember when I was uh, starting to learn guitar, I picked up a guitar. That's step number one. Write this down. If you want to learn guitar, pick one up. So I, I started to learn the guitar. I picked one up, watched a couple of videos on YouTube, looked at the chords. I was like, okay, I'm getting the hang of this. This is good. Uh, I was going to Bible college at the time, and they offered lessons there. And so I was like, great, this is good. I'll, I'll take some lessons. And my first, my first lesson, the guitar teacher was like, okay, show me what you got. Show me your skills. I had very little skills, and to this day, I have very little skills. But, uh, but anyway, he, he mentioned to me, actually, you're holding the guitar wrong. What I was doing is I was kind of bending my thumb above the, the fretboard, and you're supposed to kind of have your thumb down, right, Ryan? So you can do those six solos, and with bar chords and all those things. Yeah, and I remember I went home, and I tried his way, and it was just painful and uncomfortable. And in my mind, I'm like, and you're, my hand's cramping up. In my mind, I'm like, I don't think this is the best way. <laughs> I, I think my way is way better. Like, he's trying to hurt my hand here. What, what, what am I doing? He's trying to hurt me. <laughs> and I remember there was a moment where I was like, Brenton, you've played guitar for 16 minutes. <laughs> and you've watched YouTube videos, and this guy, you're paying to be your teacher who's played for hundreds of hours. Who knows more about guitar? (laughs) And so I had to say, okay, I'm gonna do it his way. I think he knows more. And in our life, I think it's important that we recognize this with God. He knows more. He knows more about my life. He knows more about the path that he set out for me, that he ordained for me, that he wrote in his book. And so it's important that I I submit to him and I say, God, lead me. I think I maybe know what I should do with my life or who I am, but but I I actually need to submit to you and your ways and, and in your direction in my life. And that's, I think that's the moment that's, our lives really take off because this is where God commits to guiding us and leading us through our life. And this is kind of this next part of the psalm here. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Kind of an interesting to say. It's like, I can't get away. If I go up to the heavens, you're just there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, If I settle at the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, I'm going to hide in the dark from God. And the light become night around me, even the darkness won't be dark to you. The night will shine as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. And so David is just talking about the infiniteness of God and the fact that he is everywhere. He's everywhere. There's no escaping God. You can't run 
and you can't hide from God, you are just everywhere, right? And, and Jonah came to know this. God gave him a task of, of preaching to the people of Nineveh, and he came up with a genius plan. I'm going to run away from God. I'm going to get on a boat and just try to sail away from God because I don't like this plan. It didn't really work that well, right? <laughs> Imagine like what God was thinking, like, do you know who I am, Jonah? Like, you're not going to get very far from me because I'm everywhere, so you can't get away from me. And so Jonah was at the far side of the sea, but even there, God's hand was, was guiding him. God didn't just let him go and say, okay, well, I guess the plan I had for him is that's a wash. He can just do whatever he wants, and I won't ever see him again. No, even at the far side of the sea, his hand is there, and he's guiding us. And I think that's so comforting. I think that's so awesome. And I think if we ask Jonah, Jonah, are you glad that you couldn't run away from God? Jonah would ultimately say, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad it did, that didn't work. I'm glad that I was swallowed by a fish and spit out back on sea. I'm glad that that God didn't give up on me even though I tried to run away from him. And I think this is an amazing fact about God is that you can spend your whole entire life running away from him, but you don't get very far. He's there. He still loves you. He he doesn't give up on the plan that that he made for you. And there's no... There's no amount of distance between you and God that's, that's too great. There's no uh, amount of mistakes you can make that, that your relationship can't be restored. If you look at the, the story of the prodigal son, I bet the son, um, as he squandered his father's inheritance on wild living and, and he was feeding pigs, I bet at that moment that the amount of distance between him and God felt insurmountable. There was just no getting back to the father. He, he had ruined it, and, and it was all gone. He threw it away. The purpose on his life, the plan on his life was, was gone. But was that the case? No. He just had to leave his, his muck and leave that place and come back to his father, and his father embraced him and, and took him home and said, my son has returned. Let's have a party. And this is our life too. I don't know if, if COVID has been a time of, of you maybe trying to dodge God, maybe not getting on a boat and sailing away. There's no really boats to get on around here and you can't sail that far. But maybe you've been dodging God. Maybe you've just been ignoring God. Maybe you've known the plans that God has for your life and you've just been like, no, 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 no. You will not, and you will never get far. And he'll never give up. His, even at the far side of the sea, he's trying to guide you. And, 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 and he's there. And that's good, good news. And the beautiful thing is that God is not only everywhere. He's, he's in our life and he's, he's hands on. He's not, just wa- he's not just watching our life and eating popcorn in heaven. He's not just here in, in a sense that he's, he's, dis- like he's just... It's not personal. His hand is in our life. Look what it says. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle at the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So God's hand is in our life no matter where we are, holding us fast, guiding us. Look what it said in verse five. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. And I, this, this verse is wild. It, it's really saying God is in just as real in my past as he's in my present, and just as there in my future as he's in my present. This is when your mind starts getting a little scrambly, right? But it's like, how does that work? How, how is he in my past? and my present and my future all at the same time, what's going on, but God's not bound by time, right? So even right now, every time I come to this point in the the sermon, I just get encouraged because I'm like, man, I'm a little nervous right now, but five seconds 
Five seconds later, God's in that moment and he's helping me and he's there for me. And five seconds earlier, God's in that moment and he's there and he's helping me. And in my present, right now, his hand is upon me. And so if this is true and this is real, imagine if we would just know this, really know this fact, that every moment in our life is essentially a God moment, right? He is there, he's present, and his hand is involved. If we, if we knew this, like knew, knew this in, in a very real way, I think we would be, I think a few things would change in our life. I think one thing that would change is we would walk with Godfidence in our life. And I, I like that word Godfidence because sometimes I'm confident. I'm confident. But sometimes my confidence is based on my skills or just like my history. Like I get up to preach and it's like I've, I've done this hundreds of times. Don't worry. I know how to speak to people. I know how to say some Jesus things and I'm good. Every time I get to that place, it's just bad. It's bad. You get prideful or you fall on your face and, and, and God's like, are you ready to trust in me and my power? And then I'm like, but Godfidence is so different. Godfidence is God's with me. His hand is upon me here. He's guiding me. It's, it's all about him and his ability and him empowering me instead of me trying to just be something that I can't do. And so if I think if I knew every moment that he was there, I would walk with a Godfidence. This is why David could say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil. Think of how cool that statement is. I could walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's a it's a scary valley to walk through. If I'm walking, up, if I'm walking somewhere, I don't, walk, I don't want to walk there. But even though his life was tough, he was surrounded by enemies, even though things were bleak, the valley of the shadow of death, he didn't have to fear. Because he could walk knowing that God was in that moment, before him, ahead of him, guiding him, holding him, laying his hands upon him so he could walk without fear. I think if we knew every moment was a God moment, I think gratefulness would just bubble out of our, our hearts all the time. And this is one thing I just realized, the more I realize every day is a God day, every moment is a God moment, the more I just, I start praising God for just like anything. You're in Superstore and you're getting groceries and it's like, God, thank you for food. Oh, it's, food is so good. God, thank you for my wife that maybe will make this meal. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're just worshiping God. And I think that's so awesome and important. I want, how many of you want gratefulness to bubble up in your hearts? I really do. Because, because it's giving God credit, right? It's giving God glory. It's not just saying, ah, oh, whatever, this life is just this life. No, it's saying, God, there's so many good things that you've given me. I praise you. I love you, God. And it's just awesome. I think if every moment, if I knew every moment was a God moment, passion and compassion would just bubble up in my heart as well. When I am going to and fro and interacting with people, but God is there, all of a sudden, the conversation's not about me anymore. It's about them and the person that God put in my life today. And, and, and I start just, just spending time with God and being like, God, how, how do you want me to love this person? How do you want me to bless this person? And compassion arises because I'm in tune with the Holy Spirit, right? And when Jesus was walking this earth, this is what happened. He was tired after a long day, but he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them. And when I realized that today is a God day, so every person that I, I meet today, that God knew about that, he ordained that, I think all of a sudden passion and compassion arise. If we really know every moment's a God moment, our life would be dripping with purpose. 
it would be filled with purpose. Is your life filled with purpose? What, what's your purpose? We all have some kind of purpose. But sometimes our purpose is, is a little fickle, right? Like what's the purpose of like on a Wednesday? That's hard, right? Finding purpose on a Wednesday? Yikes, man. Sometimes my purpose on a Wednesday is, you know, we're just thinking like, it's Wednesday, stuck in the middle. Tomorrow's Thursday. Uh, And then it's Friday, okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go, it's Friday. And that Friday is significant. Every, all my dreams and everything will just come true on that weekend. But then the weekend arrives and it's like, what, it's Monday? Oh no, not Monday. What can I live for on a Monday? I guess Friday is, it's kind of, how many days is that? Oh, it's, that's a while. <laughs> no, but Monday can be significant. Monday can be a God moment. Look what it says later in the Psalm. All the days are ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Come on, Mondays, Mondays. Mondays are important. God wants to do something on a, on, on a Monday in your life. And how, do, you, do we really want to live a life where we're just living until we're not working all the time? That doesn't make sense because we work all the time. <laughs> that's, that's not a good way to enjoy your life. No, God put you in your workplace on Monday for a purpose. He ordained that day. He wrote that day in your book. And I believe that moment is significant. He's before you on Monday. He's ahead of you on Monday. He's present with you on Monday. His hand is upon you on Monday. He's holding you fast on Monday. And I think if we realize that God was everywhere in every moment, with us every, in every moment, guiding us every moment, our life would be filled with purpose. Amen? That's huge. Let's finish this psalm here. It says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts to me, your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I'm awake, I'm still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those that hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. So all of a sudden, David kind of, it almost would seem he takes a little bit of a tangent, but I think what's happening here is David has just spent time just looking at, God, you're so great. You're so knowledgeable. You're everywhere. You're glorious. You made me. And there's sin. And there's these people, and they misuse their name. I I, I think it's just, uh, there's a reality that the more we get caught up with the splendor and grandeur of God, the more I think we'll hate sin in our life. The more we'll look at the injustices of the world, and we'll say, oh, that's that's not right. God doesn't like that. Ah, these people, they're they're not serving you. They're not loving you. And, and, And that passion will arise in our hearts. And earlier, God, David is kind of talking about now God being his creator, how he was knit together by God. His inmost being was knit together by God. I think that's cool. When I think God creating me, sometimes I just think of the, the outside. And you ask questions like, God, why do I have all these marks on my face and my back and all these things? And that's, a, that's an aspect of God making me, but God also made my inmost being, my character, my personality, that's fashioned and made by God. I don't know if you've heard this phrase, his body is sculpted by the gods. Sometimes people say that when someone has a, a six pack and muscles, those things I don't have. But get this, my body was sculpted by the one and only God. Come on. <laughs> that's pretty great. And, and David says in the Psalm, I praise you, God. 
I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow, God. I praise you. Thanks for making me. Your works are wonderful. You did a good job when you made me, God. I know that full well, he says. And I think that's just a healthy reality that, that I'm valuable because I'm made by God. I'm made purposely by God for a purpose. And he didn't make mistakes and he ordained my life and he gave me purpose. I'm not trash. I'm not trash. Who's seen Toy Story 4? One, two people. No, there's more, I'm sure. Yes. It's a great movie. Those are the only movies that make me cry every time. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> you're in the theater and you're just weeping. Um, there's a character in Toy Story 4 uh, called Forky. And, 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 and Forky is made out of a spork and some pipe cleaner. And all of a sudden, Forky comes to life. And Forky is now uh, kind of a, a living being. And all the other toys are like, what's going on? There's this, this spork thing that's living. And, and Forky is Bonnie's favorite toy. Bonnie just loves Forky so much. Every night, Bonnie sleeps with Forky. But the only thing when Forky is first made that he ends up saying is what? Yes, I'm trash. I'm trash. And he just goes like this and he tries to throw himself in the dumpster all the time. And he's like, I'm trash, I'm trash, I'm trash. And all the toys have to convince him, Forky, like you're, they're all jealous of him because this Bonnie, the one who made Forky, just loves and adores Forky. And Forky's just like, I'm trash, I'm trash. And I think some of us can develop that, that mindset. I don't know how it happens but we look at maybe what our culture says is beautiful, or our culture says is important, or our culture says is, is a valuable or a person of value, and we end up saying, I'm trash. But we're not trash. God made us. He wove us together in his mother's womb. My, my days are, ordain, are ordained, and God cares about me. I want to read these verses again. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They can't be numbered. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. This, this is really saying God, his thoughts about who you are outnumber the grains of sand. It's like, God, why would you want to think about me that much? I don't want to think about me that much. Am I really anything special? Well, to God, you are. God values you. God loves you. Look what it says in Luke 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? What does that mean? Aren't sparrows useless to you people? You don't care about them. You sell five of them for two pennies. Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. That's cool. God's saying, you don't value sparrows at all. They're not important to you. You sell five for two pennies. I don't forget a single sparrow. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. That's how much God cares about you. That's why Jesus put this here right now. Your hair, the hairs on your head aren't just counted for accounting reasons in heaven, just because it's good to have on file all the hair tracking, all the angels are like, oh man, this guy, these people are losing hair and growing hair so fast, it's hard to keep track. It's just saying that God cares so much about every detail of your life. He sees you, he knows you, and you're not forgotten by him. And it says, don't be afraid. You're worth much more than many sparrows. He's not gonna forget about you. He made you, he loves you. Your life is, is written in his book. You're important to him. And when I look at all of these things in the psalm, it, it, it just brings me to the conclusion of, wow, God, you're awesome. God, you know so much. God, you're everywhere. God, you, you made me wonderful. Sometimes maybe I don't have that perspective, but that's the truth. Well, God, I, then, then that means I'm just, I want to give my life to you. I'm yours. And this is how David concludes the psalm. God, search me, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
There's just the submission to, to God who, who knows David more than David knows David, who is there guiding David, who made David and sees David and loves David and values David. So David just says, God, my life is yours. Lead me, guide me. God, you know more about me than I know about me. So let's live this life that you have planned for me. Amen? Awesome, let's pray. God, I thank you for this truth this morning. And it's always so amazing, God, just to look at how incredible you are and what that means for my life. Father, I just thank you that you have such a significant plan for each and every one of us here. There are no mistakes in the room. There's no people that you don't have a specific purpose set aside for. There's no life here where you didn't ordain or write in your book, Lord God. And there's no person that's forgotten by you. You know each and every one of us, Father. God, I just pray that the, those realities would sink in. The reality of you being present would sink in. That you're before me, that you're ahead of me. That that would truly just sink in this morning and we would, we would just erupt in praise, Lord God. And gratefulness. And we just let you lead us, Father. God, we just want to submit to your ways. Search our hearts test our hearts, know our anxious thoughts, and lead us in the way everlasting, Father. We love you. We praise you. And I just pray these truths would just, um, your spirit would continue to reveal these truths to each and every one of your sons and daughters here today. Amen. Let's stand and worship.
never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. you don't know if you have any needs this week that you need to talk through and pray through that we are here for you and reach out to somebody you know and just know also that he is for you and he loves you you can be confident in that go with the Lord and uh, have a wonderful week just have a seat for now you'll get ushered out today